preemptive war by its very nature is something that is is entirely new to the United States of America and to what we call the, the old Western alliance. Uh, let's, you know, you go back through history and and at the Peace of Westphalia in, in, in 1648, a, a group of nations that had just killed most of each other off decided that this isn't quite the way to do it. And they came up with a set of laws that we've all lived with fairly well uh, since then, uh, which doesn't much allow for preemptive war. I think the real reasons behind the Iraq War lie in a, a almost a, a kind of philosophical and geopolitical vision of the neoconservatives uh, who dominate our foreign policy establishment today. And that is the belief that the United States does dominate the world as the world's sole superpower, that it, ha it must assert its power globally, uh, everywhere, and that anyone who resists this or defies American power is absolutely unacceptable and becomes automatically very much the enemy. The theory that you can bludgeon political grievances out of existence uh, doesn't have much of a track record. Uh, and uh, so essentially we, are, we have been neoconned into applying a uh, school of thought about foreign affairs that has failed everywhere it's been tried. So by the late 1990s, let alone 2003, it was clear that Iraq did not have a nuclear weapons program. But over and over again, President Bush, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, particularly Vice President Cheney, but also National Security Advisor Condi Rice, drummed up the idea of a reconstituted nuclear capability and particularly the notion that I think has some resonance among the American people of the mushroom cloud. For those who are advancing a different doctrine with which I strongly disagree and that was that the United States could take unilateral preemptive action. But if you believe in unilateral preemptive action, it certainly has to be in response to an imminent threat. And the idea that Saddam Hussein could have nuclear weapons uh, was a, a, a truly an imminent threat, and nothing more graphically um, uh, pointed that out it, it, ex, it, it, except the most powerful argument that was made, let's not let the smoking gun be a nuclear cloud. If someone is waiting for a so-called smoking gun, it's certain that we will have waited too long. We don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. We cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun that could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. So a lot of people who supported the war in Iraq actually believed that Iraq had the capability to fire missiles that could reach the United States carrying payloads of nuclear or chemical or biological weapons. Iraq has never had the capability to do that. They didn't have it in the first Gulf War. They didn't have it in this uh, war in Iraq and they don't have it uh, in any way of getting it in the future. That very first day on September 12th, one day after September 11, uh, the meeting that was held in the White House, in the Situation Room, uh, led to Rumsfeld asking the question, shouldn't we use this as an opportunity to do something about Iraq as well? There are Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Saddam Hussein, um, cavorts with terrorists. Secretly and without fingerprints, he could provide one of his hidden weapons to terrorists or help them develop their own. Well, the war really had absolutely nothing to do with terrorism. Uh, there was no connection whatsoever between Iraq and the secular regime there and the religious fanatics who perpetrated 9-11. Saddam was not a maniac or a fool. He was a terrible villain, yes, but he was not going to sacrifice his own life and the future of his country to stupid adventures with terrorists who had completely antithetical views to his. It is just inconceivable to anybody who understands Saddam Hussein and understands the nature of highly centralized dictatorships generally that uh, dictators would want to give up control of their most potent weaponry. Because once you've given up control, you have no control. So you can't say to Al-Qaeda, you will use this or you won't use it. The decision on whether or not they're going to use it depends on what Osama bin Laden does. Do you want to entrust your fate to Osama bin Laden and his nihilistic ways? 
I don't think so. Saddam Hussein is a psychopath and a sociopath. He was not an irrational being in the sense that he was going to um, ensure his own demise by doing something like that. Al-Qaeda has had total contempt for Saddam Hussein himself. He's been a socialist. He's been very harsh. He's treated Islamic leaders, Islamist leaders, extremely harshly. Iraq, and we have very good intelligence on this, was not part of the picture of terrorism before we invaded. Saddam Hussein and bin Laden were enemies. Bin Laden considered and said that Saddam Hussein was the socialist infidel. These were very different kinds of individuals competing for power in their own way, and Saddam Hussein made very sure that al-Qaeda couldn't function uh, in Iraq, that terrorists couldn't function, except for the small northeastern quadrant of the country where there was an extremist group, but he had no control over that. It was near the Iranian border. There's no doubt that Anzar al-Islam is a radical Islamic terrorist group with ties to al-Qaeda, but they operate in a part of Iraq that is not controlled by Hussein. The leaders say they seek to overthrow Hussein and his government. They are our enemy, or really they are also our enemy. We believe that Saddam Hussein, him and his group and his ministers also, they are outside of Islamist zone. The ties with al-Qaeda was just a scare tactic to exploit the trauma, the very real trauma that the American people have felt ever since 9-11, and to associate that trauma with Iraq. As you know from the polls, most Americans believed that Iraq had something to do with 9-11, and that was a very successful, very deliberate, and very unethical and immoral operation on the part of the PR people of this administration.